the 1970s, undercover DEA agent Michael Vigil was about to risk his life for a top secret mission. A week earlier, Mike had conducted a meeting with some ruthless Mexican drug traffickers with the help of one of his many informants. He had told them that his primary supplier had been murdered, and he was desperate for a new source of narcotics to feed the insatiable appetite of his clients in the United States. Now, he was supposed to meet him at a local restaurant to consummate the drug deal. The convoy was filled with a dozen or more battled-hardened Mexican Federal Judicial Police MFJP, each carrying lethal weaponry, including machine guns. They were prepared to shoot first and ask questions later, for they had little to zero tolerance for surveillance and undercover operations. Mike, on the other hand, was born to do just that, and he knew what was at stake if the MFJP decided to take matters into their own hands. And so as the caravan lurched into the heart of the town, the MFJP surged ahead, taking up positions of strategic advantage, ready to unleash a hail of bullets at the slightest hint of danger. Mike, on the other hand, pulled into the restaurant, his nerves jangling with a sense of unease as he worked on stealing himself for the worst case scenarios, knowing that his survival depended on his ability to remain calm and focused in the face of unimaginable danger. Shortly, the drug dealers walked into the restaurant. Their eyes flickered with suspicion and malice, sizing Mike up with a keen sense of danger. But the agent was not deterred. He knew how to play the game and ease their minds with idle chatter and small talk. It was a delicate dance, one that required precision and finesse, and Mike had mastered it over the years. Knowing that the traffickers would demand to see a substantial amount of US dollars before making the delivery, Mike prepared what he called a flash roll of cash. It consisted of arranging large stacks of $1 bills, placing a $100 bill on each side of the bundles, and then taping them to his ankles. When the traffickers asked for the money, he raised his pant legs to reveal the bundles of cash. They didn't count it, only glancing at it before smiling greedily. But before they handed him the drugs, one of the traffickers made a gesture to reveal his shiny gold gun grips and snarled with a deadly tone. If you're a federal agent, we'll kill you. Although he had no doubt the trafficker was sincere, Mike couldn't let himself show any shred of fear. He knew that even a bead of sweat would make him dead meat. Mike kept pattering for a while more, until it was time for them to leave the restaurant and wait for the truckload of the drug to arrive. That's when all hell broke loose. Out of the blue, one of the MFJP agents broke his cover and rushed in, pointing his gun at the trafficker. The trafficker quickly grabbed the gun barrel and turned it towards the agent. A gunshot rang out, and Mike watched in horror as the agent's blood sprayed into the air. Then the trafficker turned towards Mike, firing two shots that barely missed his head. Mike pulled out his gun and fired back, the bullets hitting the trafficker's chest. He stumbled backwards, gasping and moaning, before finally collapsing to the ground. Death was always around the corner in the world of undercover work in Mexico. But despite the constant danger, Michael Vigil was always driven by his desire to uphold the law and put as many drug traffickers as he could behind bars. And to truly understand how he became the fearless operative he was, we must start from the very beginning. Small Town to Dark Underworld Michael Vigil's journey from small town roots to DEA agent began with a dream instilled by his hardworking parents. With unwavering integrity, courage, and a love for the intrigue of law enforcement, he pursued a criminology degree and applied to numerous state and federal agencies. He found his calling when the Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA, came into existence on July 1, 1973, after President Richard Nixon declared an all-out war on the drug menace. The agency's mandate was to combat drug trafficking globally, making it the only agency with a charter to work both domestically and abroad. And Mike was particularly interested in their undercover operations, Bree saw that going undercover was like playing the ultimate chess game. And so the first of his long and fulfilling journey was written. Right into the belly of the beast. Mike was first assigned to the Albuquerque field office in New Mexico. And from the start, he learned that the world he signed up for was one filled with danger and dread. In his book, Deal, Mike wrote that undercover work was not for the timid. 
Your mind has to be crystal clear and sharp enough to adapt to any situation. Drug deals are unpredictable, and the traffickers are always ready to change the situation to their advantage. You have to be the perfect actor, for making a single mistake could cost you more than an Oscar. And Mike was a master in his trade. One of his strongest suits was that he could transform himself into any persona required and speak perfect Spanish. And to infiltrate the high-level drug trafficking rings, he had to blend in. He dressed in luxurious sports jackets, wore Italian loafers, and flaunted four diamond-studded rings and a long gold chain. The heroin traffickers in New Mexico were seasoned criminals, and many had already served time in prison for drug offenses, and Mike effortlessly slipped into their world of crime by perfecting the art of undercover work. He knew how to erase any thought of being a federal agent and completely transform himself into a hardened drug trafficker. He spoke their language, adopted their habits, and immersed himself in their cunning. He danced on the edge of danger, constantly teetering on the brink of being made. Yet he always managed to talk his way out of the most perilous situations. During one operation, Mike was wearing a wire to record the negotiations with the drug dealers. The batteries leaked and burned his stomach with caustic acid. Mike recalls that he could smell his own flesh burning, and the pain was excruciating. But he managed to hold his composure, enduring the agony for hours, knowing that being shot would have been far worse. And when faced with the pressure to try the drugs he was buying, he skillfully manipulated the traffickers into believing that he was motivated solely by money, not by the insidious pull of addiction. Each time he lied his way out of their grasp, he knew that his luck could run out at any moment, that the next slip of the tongue could mean his demise. But after years of work, he developed a sixth sense, and he could read people quickly, picking up on signals that could mean life or death. And in Mike's world, where trust was a fragile commodity, and the looming specter of death was always close at hand, that sixth sense would soon prove itself time and time again. Operation Heroin B Mike won the confidence of several drug lords through his string of informants who gained him the introductions, and from there, he would make fictitious deals to bring the bad guys down. The top guys would always test him, questioning his acquaintances, delving into his background, and asking about the other traffickers who could vouch for him. Walking on a razor's edge, he would always tread carefully and reply with, no one you know when things got precarious, and they would buy it. Because ultimately, he knew they were greedy people whose eyes flashed with dollar signs. He would repeatedly rehearse and revise the fabricated story with his informant before entering the risky situation, knowing that with any slip-up, the consequences would be swift and ruthless. One undercover operation Mike remembers by heart happened in the mid-1970s. The DEA launched Operation Heroin B to combat the flood of narcotics pouring into the U.S. from Mexico. Mike was tasked with taking down the biggest and most dangerous heroin trafficker in the western U.S. at the time, James Orlando Quintana. Quintana ran an extensive and highly structured drug organization with tentacles that stretched deep into Mexico. Even other ruthless drug lords were afraid of him, and for a good reason. Quintana was highly intelligent and charismatic, with the power to manipulate and control those around him. He was a born leader, and yet chose to use his talents for evil instead of good, and his end would be a tragic one. The DEA's investigation into Quintana began with a potential informant serving time in prison. The informant didn't have direct access to Quintana, but he could introduce Mike to a lower-level dealer who worked for Quintana and his principal lieutenant. Henry Gutierrez. The informant was paroled for short periods, and Mike had to keep a close eye on him to ensure he wouldn't escape. The situation was complicated, and Mike had to be at the top of his game. Eventually, Mike was introduced to Isaac Rui Balid, a principal lieutenant and enforcer for Quintana and Gutierrez. Negotiations progressed, and a meeting was arranged with Quintana and Gutierrez at a local bar. Naturally, they were suspicious but Mike convinced them that he was a legitimate heroin dealer. The DEA decided to attempt to trade diamonds for heroin in order to have Quintana and Gutierrez deal directly with Mike. They managed to get several diamond rings from a local jeweler, 
and Mike told Rui Balid he had just robbed a jewelry store in New Mexico. Quintana and Gutierrez were interested in the exchange, and the transaction was completed. The DEA coordinated with state and local agencies to execute the arrests of Quintana, Gutierrez, Rui Balid, and many others. The arrest took place without resistance, and Mike walked into the office where Quintana and Rui Belid were being held, introducing himself as a special agent of the DEA. They almost fell off their chairs. Quintana was able to post bail and was released pending trial, but he had no intention of returning to prison and fled. After more than a year of searching, the U.S. Marshals, with the help of Mike, finally found Quintana in a residence in Kansas City. Once they entered the house, they found Quintana's body in the hallway with a pistol lying nearby. He didn't want to return to prison and took the easy way out. Quintana was a truly evil man, and his reign of terror was over. But Mike couldn't help but wonder what he could have accomplished if he had chosen a different path. The world would never know, and Quintana's legacy would always be one of darkness and despair. But after working for several years in the U.S., Mike decided to play the game at its highest stakes and plunge even deeper into the ruthless underworld. Crossing Enemy Lines With a hunger to bring more bad guys to justice, Mike applied for a position at the DEA office of Sonora, Mexico. Because of his impressive closure rate, he was immediately selected for the position. Working in Mexico was different from working in the United States. The primary Mexican agency for combating drugs was the MFJP, which had a reputation for being corrupt. From the beginning, Mike ran into obstacles many of the other agents engineered. He learned from several informants that when they called the office attempting to speak with them, they were told Mike wasn't available and advised not to call again. Eventually, Mike identified cotters of MFJP personnel he could trust and work with on counter-drug operations but he knew they were more operationally oriented as opposed to having investigative skills. So the DEA would conduct the investigations and then at a later stage involve the MFJP when arrests and seizures were to take place. Mike always made it a point to arrange drug transactions in public places because it minimized the potential for a drug ripoff or him being kidnapped and held for ransom. Still, the Mexican kingpins were known to be the worst of the worst making every undercover operation a Russian roulette with the odds always against him. During an operation, Mike was undercover in a local hotel, waiting for one of his informants, when he heard a loud knock on the door. Believing it was the informant, he opened the door to find a group of eight men staring back at him, all armed to the teeth with semi-auto pistols. Their leader spoke in a low, menacing voice, requesting to speak with Mike while his henchmen loomed menacingly in the background. There were Mexican agents in the room next door, but they were oblivious to the ongoing situation. Mike asked to speak to the leader alone, and as the man entered the room, his rough hand frisked Mike, trying to feel for any concealed weapons, but he had no idea what he was up against. Mike remained stoic and kept his cool, as he had done in countless other life-threatening situations. And when the man finally began to speak, Mike was appalled to realize that the men were members of the judicial police. They were convinced that Mike was a wealthy drug trafficker and were there to get a share of the cake. As the gravity of the situation dawned on him, Mike drew his weapon, which was carefully hidden and forced into the officer's mouth, threatening to pull the trigger if he didn't comply. With his heart pounding, Mike charged out of the hotel room and yelled for backup. Once again, luck was on his side. The state police were caught off guard their hands raised in surrender as he and the MFJP disarmed them one by one. It was another near miss, a testament to the daily dangers he faced as an undercover agent in Mexico. However, if you think working in Mexico was dangerous, then Colombia was like walking right into a lion's den. Risking it all after working in Mexico for several years, Mike applied for and was selected for the position of resident agent in charge of the office in Medellin, Colombia. Normally, the DEA only allowed agents to be on foreign assignments for up to six and a half consecutive years, but since Medellin at the time was known as the most violent and dangerous city in the world, the office made an exception, especially since Mike was one of their best agents. 
The entrenched power of the Colombian drug cartels posed a serious threat to the DEA's mission, with violence being their calling card. Mike saw many dead bodies strewn along the roadsides within his first week. It was a common sight with passerby stepping over them as if they were nothing but obstacles. Medellin also happened to be the operating base for the country's most significant and violent cartel, led by Pablo Escobar, alongside other notorious figures like El Mexicano, Carlos Letter Rivas, and the Ochoa brothers. The DEA had to work closely with the Colombian National Police, CNP, who lived under the constant threat of death, with a $600 bounty placed on their heads by Escobar. Mike wasted no time getting into action and was responsible for the arrest of Harold Rosenthal, a fugitive from the US. He was a former bail bondsman who had become involved in the drug trade due to his exposure to various drug traffickers. Arresting Rosenthal put a target on Mike's back, but what caused the assassination attempts to intensify was the seizure of the infamous Tranquilandia cocaine processing laboratories that belonged to the Medellin cartel which resulted in the total destruction of approximately 13.8 metric tons of cocaine, valued at over a billion dollars. The assassins hired by the drug traffickers used motorcycles to pursue their victims in heavy traffic, where they pulled alongside their target, firing weapons at point-blank range. Motorcycles were favored because they provided maneuverability in areas cars did not have in the event of being chased. One evening, as Mike left the DEA office late, he heard a motorcycle right behind his car. It was driving very fast and nearly caught up with him, but its headlights were turned off, a common assassination technique of the Medellin cartel. Two individuals ominously looked back at him as they sped by, with the passenger cradling a weapon on his lap. Mike would always wonder what stopped them from killing him at that moment. Perhaps they were just sending a message and didn't want to have the blood of a DEA agent on their hands. After a year of working in Medellin, the American ambassador decided to close the office due to the never-ending threats from the cartel. Mike went to Barranquilla on the north coast of Colombia, where he took charge of that office and received the tragic news of the brutal murder of one of his friends, Agent Kiki Camarena, by the hands of the Guadalajara cartel in Mexico. When one of their own is killed, the US government's message is always clear. Cross a line with our agents, and we'll unleash every resource at our disposal to bring the responsible to justice. And Mike was fueled by grief and a fierce determination to avenge his fallen friend, wasting no time joining the pursuit. No stone left unturned. The DEA initiated a massive global manhunt to capture Kiki Camarena's killers, including Miguel Felix Gallardo, Ernesto Fonseca Carillo, Rafael Caro Quintero, and their Honduran source of supply, Juan Ramon Mata Ballesteros. They began to conduct telephone intercepts around the world in order to locate the traffickers and also activated a global network of informants through Latin America, the Caribbean, and Europe. As a result, they located Mata Ballesteros, who was hiding in Cartagena, Colombia. Mata had been on the radar of the DEA since 1970, when he was caught with 54 kilos of cocaine at Dulles International Airport near Washington, D.C. But he managed to escape from the federal facility he was held in and continued to evade justice, slipping through their fingers time and time again. In an operation led by Mike, the DEA set up surveillance on a known associate of Mata, Jaime Garcia. Finally, they intercepted a conversation that provided a solid lead. Garcia had called his housemate to prepare for El Senor's arrival, and the DEA knew Mata was on his way. They gathered heavily armed officers and stormed the house. Mata tried to run, but he was no match for the agent pursuing him. Mata finally jumped over a wall and fell, but while sprawled on his back, he quickly aimed his gun at Mike's head, ready to take him down. However, Mike was quicker. He took out his gun and was going to kill Mata, but in a chilling moment of defiance, Mata told the agent, Don't shoot. I can get out of prison, but I can't get out of a tomb. And then came an unexpected twist. Mata had the audacity to negotiate with Mike, telling him, If you release me, I'll give you $3 million and can have the money here in 20 minutes. But of course, the agent told him there were no deals and slapped the cuffs on him, hauling him out of the house. Later on the plane to the jail, 
Mata turned to Mike and said, I want to congratulate you, because no one has been able to capture me in 20 years. The Legacy Lives On Michael Vigil's legacy looms large over the DEA's history. He was responsible for some of the agency's largest and most successful operations. The most significant one involved 36 countries in the Caribbean, Mexico, and Central and South America. And one of his most outstanding achievements came after 9-11 and the fall of the Afghani regime, which resulted in a flood of opium to the United States. He designed and implemented Operation Containment, consisting of 25 countries, including China and Russia. Vigil retired from the DEA as the Chief of International Operations a decade ago. But to this day, he still advises on anti-terrorism and fighting drug trafficking, his expertise sought after by governments and the media alike. But behind the public persona lies a man who spent years dicing with death. And for that, Michael Vigil's name will forever be commemorated in the annals of the DEA. A name that struck fear into the hearts of even the hardened criminals who crossed his path. <laughs>